Okay, I think uh, Professor Arvind will get started. Is that okay? Yep, sure, sir. Yeah, well, people are coming in, so we'll let them join, and we'll, we'll, otherwise, it'll get delayed. Thank you, uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining the uh, latest edition of uh, the webinar series organized by the IIT Alumni Center, Chennai. This is uh, part of our Faculty of the Month uh, series uh, as part of the overall webinar uh, sequence. Today we have the privilege of hosting uh, Professor Arvind Kumar Chandran, Assistant Professor in Chemical Engineering at IIT Madras, and he'll be speaking on what is required to bring green hydrogen to commercial reality and academicians' perspective. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, a few words about the alumni, IIT Alumni Center Chennai and our webinar series. The IIT Alumni Center Chennai is the first IIT Alumni Center in the world. Uh, we have just moved uh, into the IIT Madras Research Park uh, in the C block on the top floor after our first 10 years at the City uh, Club, which was in Abhiramapuram. So now we are well and truly part of the IIT uh, Madras ecosystem inside the research park. And uh, happy to, uh, to note that the Alumni Center has now reopened uh, with all due precautions being taken vis-a-vis uh, -vis the pandemic. But we are back uh, with, uh, uh, albeit limited facilities, but the cafeteria is open, the, uh, the, the lounge is open, the conference rooms are open. The uh, outdoor area is open and uh, two of our uh, uh, visiting rooms are also now available for guests. Uh, the uh, webinar series brings together the best of the Alumni Center's ecosystem in a mixed physical digital format. The initial sessions have been online only for obvious reasons and uh, will hopefully move to a suitable mix of online and physical uh, now that our new home at IIT Madras Research Park is open. Uh, multiple topic streams are using the webinar channel. More will be added based on member and participant interest and engagement. Uh, this session, as I had remarked earlier, is part of our Faculty Researcher of the Month series. Uh, we, we have had the privilege of hosting uh, Professor Krishan Balasubramaniam of IIT Madras, uh, Professor Manindra Agarwal of IIT Kanpur, uh, uh, and Professor Bhaskar Ramurthy, Director of IIT Madras in past sessions, uh, and, and these were extremely well received. Uh, if I may say so, the session by Professor Agarwal on the Sutra model for pandemic prediction, uh, which happened uh, uh, on the 14th of August, was uh, extremely interesting in not just uh, the, the sheer uh, mathematics of what had been done, but also for the relevance to the world that we're living in today. Professor Bhaskar Ramurthy spoke, spoke on uh, 5GI, the, uh, the India uh, extension to the 5G standard. Uh, Professor Krishnan spoke about his uh, pioneering work in non-destructive testing and so on. Uh, so the uh, webinar series on the faculty researcher is of course on a very uh, relevant and, and uh, extremely technically interesting topics. But we also have a lot of different sessions. We have the startup of the month series uh, where we had uh, hosted Planis Technologies, one of the uh, really exciting startups from the IIT Madras uh, uh, Research Park. Uh, we also have fun events, of course. Uh, we have has hosted our first quiz. Uh, Binakshi Ramesh uh, hosted it. Uh, we had our first storytelling session under the Bibliotech uh, stream, which Lavanya Srinivas conducted. Uh, the iTunes music uh, session, uh, we've had three brothers and a violin. Uh, and, and later, more, last week, we had the musical journey of Lakshmikant Pyarelal. And uh, we also had a very interesting session from Vijay Kamalakara, uh, CEO of Story Trails, in our Papuri session where he talked about unexpected tales behind Indian monuments. As you can see, it's a very eclectic mix of topics ranging from deep science and deep technology from the faculty series to fun events, to uh, uh, music, to quiz, to uh, uh, all kinds of interesting engagements while we are keeping ourselves safe uh, in, during the pandemic. The intent is to have a session every week uh, on the same Microsoft Teams platform, and each session is recorded. Past sessions are available on the Alumni Center website. So once again, welcome to all our members and attendees from partner institutions for this very exciting session. Now let me introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Arvind Kumar Chandran, for this uh, 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 session. He is currently, as I said, an assistant professor in the chemical engineering department at IIT Madras and is leading a research group dedicated to solar energy conversion and storage. He obtained his PhD from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, EPFL, in Lausanne in 2013, and carried out his postdoctoral research at UC Berkeley 
and the molecular foundry at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in the US. His research group at IIT Madras works on various electrochemical and photo uh, electrochemical systems, including solar water splitting, microbial photovoltaics, and metal air batteries. Their research covers a complete spectrum of applications from materials development to device prototyping. One of their recent works on the perovskite materials for light emitters fetched a DST SERP Technology Translation Award uh, from the Department of Science and Technology in India. He and his team are looking at offering technical and research solutions for producing green hydrogen, which indeed is his topic for today. So if, if I look at hydrogen, it's an essential element used in multiple sectors today, uh, including ref oil refineries, the fertilizer sector, steel production, and so on. Predominantly, it's derived from fossil fuels, and this sort of hydrogen is called brown, gray, or blue hydrogen. Green hydrogen, on the other hand, is derived from renewables and is now becoming more and more important as we look at means to mitigate the emissions crisis, the race to net zero, and the battle uh, towards climate change. And this green hydrogen is going to be a very, very critical factor to restore the good health of the planet. Now, how do you switch to green hydrogen, given that we are still in the brown, gray, blue uh, uh, fossil fuel dry driven hydrogen production stream conventionally today. To switch to green hydrogen, a significant scientific policy, scientific and policy level changes need to be implemented. One, to exploit mature technologies on solar to hydrogen conversion. And the second is to think of futuristic research activities for developing or improving the existing, perhaps even completely new radical systems. I invite Professor Arvind to share his views as an academician on what are these options, what can be implemented right away, and most importantly, what's his view on the future? Over to you, Professor Arda. Thank you so much, uh, sir. That's a great, good introduction. And especially, I should also thank our audience uh, for spending the time on Saturday evening. Typically, I have always trouble teaching people. Uh, I'm, I'm sharing my screen. Hope uh, it's visible. Yes, uh, we can see uh, the screen, but not your your slides. Yeah. Uh, now now we can see us. Right. So yeah, I, I should uh, typically when I whenever I teach on Friday afternoon, I always have trouble keeping anyone awake. And hopefully on Saturday afternoon, uh, hopefully some of you uh, people got a bit of nap, so you don't get sleep during the talk. And also I try to keep everyone engaged. Let me see how how it's going to go. And uh, as has been introduced, uh, I'm Aravind. I'm a faculty in chemical engineering, and uh, recently we have also gotten a big center funded by. Uh, IIT Madras, which is uh, Center for Photo and Electrochemical Energy. I'm leading uh, this center as well. So today, what I'm going to talk is what is required to bring that renewable hydrogen. Of course, the word green hydrogen has been used to uh, define the renewable hydrogen to the commercial reality. So um, I mean, like I've talked to many people, like whatever that I'm going to discuss today, it's not going to be too technical, but it's going to be a kind of mixed perspective that I've kind of obtained by talking to a lot of people in industry and a lot of people from academia. And I try to give my own uh, like kind of a meaning to all those things and compile them. And I'm going to put that to you. And at the end of the session, what I want everyone to literally take, uh, take uh, to their home is what can be done right away and uh, what has to be done in the future in order to completely transform to green hydrogen. Before getting started, uh, I would like to just quickly show what our group is all about. And uh, we are a group of nearly like 30 plus people working on one fundamental aspect that is photo and electrochemistry. And we apply this to various applications, including uh, water splitting and uh, carbon dioxide reduction. And both these things come under a common uh, theme of solar fuels. And then we also work on a lot on solar cells. And uh, recently, we stepped onto light emitters. It was just a serendipitous discovery in our lab that made us to work on this light emitters. I'll be talking a bit about this today. And uh, finally, we also work on metal air batteries. So essentially, like metal air batteries and solar water splitting to generate hydrogen, they have the same chemical reaction. I mean, as a person in academia, for me, it's just an equation. 
uh, like uh, water splitting into hydrogen and oxygen, or I combine an hydrogen and oxygen to get water. So, however, from the application perspective, it can be completely different. It can be just batteries, or it can be just a solar hydrogen uh, uh, production. So, for me, the base is photoelectrochemistry and just equations, and we apply to various applications, and we are very successful in all these uh, four domains of research at the moment. And uh, I, before I really get started on uh, the hydrogen, I would like to thank my entire team. We are really one of the like best teams at IIT Madras. I have really brilliant uh, scientists and engineers in my group. And um, without them, I won't be standing here and talking to you on any research aspects. Whatever I talk today, it's just their outcome. I'm just stepping on their shoulders and presenting their results to you. And uh, money is one of the most important thing to carry out research. We have been very fortunate in the past uh, four and a half to five years since I've joined with uh, multiple funding sources that includes government funding agencies all the way to uh, industries. And uh, so we have really the state of the art labs uh, covering over 3000 square feet with really advanced facilities. And I would like to invite all of you just to come over sometime to our lab and visit us. And let me start with the basic question. Why green hydrogen? Why, first of all, we have to really talk about it. And um, I think everything starts with carbon dioxide emission, right? And so I'm going to start with that system on mind. This is um, the Niti Aayog report, where they've said in year 2021, they have been uh, using some fossil fuels equivalent to somewhere around uh, uh, 600 uh, million tons of oil equivalent. And that corresponds to nearly 1,503 million tons of carbon dioxide emission. So you can imagine like what we are emitting now. This is like nearly 1,500 million tons of carbon dioxide. This is India. I'm not saying about the entire world. This is India. And based on the economic growth, based on the population growth, it is projected by 2042, we expect to double this consumption of energy. So that will be going to be equivalent to 1,200 million tons of oil equivalent. So essentially, if we keep the same policies that we have at the moment to burn fossil fuels, you will be emitting somewhere around uh, 3,000 million tons of carbon dioxide. And this is going to be a disaster. And we are, we are seeing already the, the issues due to the carbon dioxide uh, emission. And pollution in general is not good. I think uh, although we talk about uh, carbon, uh, although we talk about global warming quite often, uh, one thing we forgot is that the direct consequences of uh, health due to the pollution in the industrial areas are much, much higher. So in general, I think moving to green sectors is always uh, welcome. So imagine, let's consider a business as usual scenario. It will go from 1,500 to 3,000 uh, million uh, tons of carbon dioxide. However, imagine if India tries to control this and try to keep any new energy generation that's going to come out in future will go either through renewables or we go through some other ways. Then we can maintain this 1,500 uh, uh, million tons of carbon uh, dioxide emission over uh, like up to 2042 and even beyond. Or we can also have a trajectory down. If you try to move to drastically to renewables, we can in fact bring this trajectory down. That's also possible. Let's assume that for now we are going to make the flat trajectory uh, from 2021 to 2042. What happens is the following we have nearly uh, this equivalent 1500 to 3000 uh, roughly correspond to 490 gigawatt of power and uh, we need to generate this 490 gigawatt of power from renewables and in fact we don't have to literally go to completely renewables here there was a nice paper from this uh, group uh, from princeton university they have in fact divided that into multiple wedges and they have proposed multiple options so i've given the options which i find probably more suitable and you find that I've divided that into seven wedges you see based on the color uh, coding here. And I've given one to afforestation. This can, in fact, consume the carbon dioxide and try to convert that to biomass. And we can go with the increasing energy efficiency. Next time when you go and try to uh, use any uh, like power sources, make sure that you turn it off when you're not going to use it. I think that's very, very important. Energy efficiency is one of the significant factors. And we also, many of us, really do waste a lot of energy and that energy comes from fossil fuel resources. And we can have wind resources. Wind is kind of fairly limited too. And the top four are the most important and it's going to create a radical change. I've assigned two wedges to solar, two wedges to solar. Essentially that is equivalent to 140 gigawatts. And let me just quickly give you a number. India at the moment has installed roughly like 35 to 40 gigawatts of solar power. 
and we are talking about 140 gigawatts. And let me also highlight what is the problem with that 140. It looks like a very simple number, right? But the thing is that if you install 140 gigawatts, you will get only one sixth of the power because the sunlight is not available 24 by 7. So obviously, you have to install at least six times of 140 gigawatts if you want to cover two edges and remove the carbon dioxide from the environment. So I'm talking about six times 140. And then there is one more thing, people working on carbon capture and utilization, carbon capture and storage. Imagine if you want to capture carbon and utilize it, how will you utilize it? You have to convert carbon dioxide to some fuels. How will you convert that to fuels? Use solar energy, wind energy. And that again requires renewables. So essentially, I can easily take three wedges. So essentially, three-fourths of this energy has to come from solar. And essentially, three-fourths of the energy has to come from solar. Because solar, there's a lot of diurnal variations, day and night, everything. And that poses a serious risk on how we are going to store this energy, how we are going to store the energy. And one thing that I want to quickly highlight is that solar energy is immense and uh, we are consuming roughly 30 terawatts of power at the moment. And you know what is available from sun? It's 120,000 terawatts. What we consume is nearly 30 terawatts. It's not much, you know, like it's like 30 terawatts, 30 terawatts, three zero, it's nothing. But then if you try to remove the uh, power from uh, like, let's say sea, inhabitable areas, then you'll roughly end up with 600 to 700 terawatts of power hitting the areas where we can potentially harness the solar energy. And even you can imagine, just 10 percentage of it is really sufficient to really uh, like convert this globe to green energy. But we should be very realistic. I don't want to be more like this newspaper reports, like, yeah, this, but these guys have done a phenomenal change and it's going to revolutionize tomorrow. But let me talk from my heart and what I think is going to be possible and what we have to do immediately and what it takes in future, what it has, what we have to do for the future of green hydrogen in order to move to this big target of removing the fossil fuels out of our daily lives. There are three general ways by which we can store hydrogen. One is, of course, you can know that, you know that batteries are the biggest uh, like resources and we all know, even in our inverter batteries at the moment in our homes, we do use batteries and batteries are one of the biggest assets. But the thing is that when you talk about megawatt, gigawatt, terawatt of power, they are not going to really sustain. It's going to be really difficult. And what technology is going to come out, that's going to be really difficult. However, there are two other options which fall under solar fuels, as I've mentioned before. One is water splitting to generate hydrogen. The other one is carbon dioxide reduction. Within water splitting, there are some technologies which are mature, some technologies which are still at the research phase in the lab, lab scale. And in carbon dioxide reduction, almost every technology is at the research level and are at the pilot level, not commercialized very, very successfully. So essentially, I rule this carbon dioxide out of the scenario for now because it's only futuristic. And immediate, immediately implementing carbon dioxide reduction to fuels is not going to happen. What I mean by immediate is two years, three years, and less than five years. And this is going to take a while. It has to be tested vigorously. Batteries, out of the discussion also. Now, let me concentrate on water splitting to generate hydrogen. So, you know, hydrogen is a, like a literally commodity chemical, actually, almost a commodity chemical. It's been widely used in three sectors, three sectors. Fertilizers, you know, ammonia is one of the biggest uh, consumers of hydrogen. At the moment, we get the hydrogen from the fossil fuels. I mean, whenever we eat rice, they use fertilizers to grow that. And uh, that uh, fertilizer come from ammonia and ammonia consume hydrogen from the fossil fuels. Eventually, even what you are eating is emitting carbon dioxide. No, this is the biggest <laughs> disaster and a pity that we have to literally, whenever we touch our foot plate, we should think of carbon dioxide also. Although I think we shouldn't think too much about it while well, just enjoy the taste of the food. And in metal production, steel industry consume a lot of hydrogen. And refineries to desulfurize, they use a lot of hydrogen. These are three sectors where hydrogen is being used predominantly. And let's say by 2030, it can be extended to three more sectors, predominantly in transportation. And transportation, road transport, as well as air and sea transport. At the moment, you know, like India has like like, like more than 30 to 40 percentage of energy production goes to transportation, right? Various sectors of transportation. And eventually, those sectors have not exploited hydrogen much. So if you could provide a economical and viable, economically viable hydrogen and this technology, so this domain also can harness the benefit of green hydrogen and eventually move to the housing all over power house house housing like heating house heating in india we don't have the heating business it's probably north india requires heating during the winter season 
and we need air conditioners, everything may go in the green hydrogen. So essentially, I'm giving you the perspective. Hydrogen has a large possibility to penetrate into our daily lives. But how to implement it? That is the biggest problem, you know? So at the moment, the easiest option would be like we have solar panels and electrolyzers. I'm not going to go into the details, but I'm going to discuss that in the coming slides. Solar panels, the technology is very well established. Of course, even at IIT Metras, you see, you see several megawatts of solar panels are being installed. And the, many of them come with like 15 plus years warranty. It's like really cool. And electrolyzers, electrolyzers are nothing but take current from the solar panel, convert them to hydrogen, split water to generate hydrogen and oxygen. So that hydrogen can be used. The electrolyzer technology is also fairly mature. Not as mature as solar panels, but definitely come at TRL 8, TRL 9 level. The electrolyzers are also very well established. Now, the thing is that how to integrate these two and meet the Indian energy requirement? I'm going to talk about that quite extensively. And the next thing is futuristic. What I mean, as I've said, futuristic, it may come out five years down the line. It has a lot of advantages. Here I'm talking about solar panel and electrolyzer. It, has, it is a multi-component system. Like it's, it's like two system, it, it adds up to the cost. Can I bring both the job of converting or uh, harvesting the sunlight at the same time splitting water with a single system? Yes, that's possible with photoelectrochemical devices. And that's going to be futuristic. And we have some issues associated with it too. Now, thanks might look very easy from the way I've said solar panels from electrolyzers. Let me just quickly give you a feel of how that works. I'm taking a solar panel, I'm installing it in my rooftop, and I use some power conditioning unit in order to meet the power requirements of electrolyzer, which splits hydrogen and oxygen. You know, Then hydrogen can go to a tank, and once uh, some amount of hydrogen uh, pressure is generated inside this hydrogen tank, we can use a high pressure compressor, store that as a compressed gas, and uh, if someone thinks they want to use cryogenic uh, condensation, they can do that too. But I think this is probably the most viable thing at the moment. And you can supply that to industry or transportation. It looks so simple, right? But the problem comes here. Here is the solar energy resource map from National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And you can see this uh, intensity mapping, whatever we are seeing here, it is about kilowatt hour per meter square per day kilowatt hour per meter square per day. And this is given with 10 kilometer radius uh, as a resolution. That's what they've they they have given here. So the present day in Chennai typically receives roughly four kilowatt hour per day, which means you can generate four, like four kilowatt hour means you can probably, if you're using a 16 to 20 percentage device, uh, like one fifth of that can be converted to electricity. That's what it means. So you can see that there is a lot of variations across the entire country. So can we have a single solution of integrating like a standard set of solar panels and electrolyzers with a standard power conditioning unit and meet the requirements of the entire country? The answer is definitely no, because the illumination of, from the sunlight or the sunlight intensity is very much dependent on the location. I'm going to add one more complication to it. In fact, uh, back in 2017, around 2018, we did take data from uh, NASA and MNRI website uh, uh, like on solar energy availability. And we averaged the data from 20, uh, 2007 to 2014. And then we tried to map it as a function of year, as a function of month, even as a function of day. I'm showing one such data for Jammu and Kashmir because this gives a lot of variation. So I've selected this date. This is our own analysis from NASA website. And the previous data just gives an average over year, like between like the, the, the 10 years average, uh, like the, so, so like nearly uh, uh, 10 years. Now I'm, I'm giving you an average of 2007 to 2014, every month, every month. So if you see that in January, you generate somewhere like the sunlight availability in Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir is somewhere around one to two kilowatt hour per meter square per day. However, if you go to June, it's fairly intense. You get somewhere between six to 7.5 kilowatt hour per meter square per day. Now, I'm adding one more complexity. It's not just location dependent. Even within a given location, the sunlight intensity varies between season to season. And it's not, the, the variation probably in Tamil Nadu is fairly little. In Maharashtra is fairly little. The more you go up north, it's, it's fairly large. It's fairly large. Thing is that now, Imagine I try to build an electrolyzer solar panel combination based on June's data. And that's going to really create trouble in January because the amount of hydrogen I'm going to produce in June will be far, far higher than the amount of hydrogen that I'm going to produce in Jan. And I think 
India really needs to look into this issue. And uh, we should not just focus on the scientific articles that, of, that are of high impact and that are valued by the rest of the world, but that can be valued within India. This is a very strong statement, I know, but I, I have to really say that almost all of us, like including me as a researcher, as an academician, we really look into this India-centric issue. And in fact, if we solve this issue, we can literally project it to the rest of the world also. US is a pioneer, and they have like state of the art National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which is doing all this business. And I think it is really the high time to really step onto it. Now, I'm going to add one more complexity. Within a June, any given day, the sunlight intensity varies between 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. See that like in the midday, it will be quite high. Uh, like during the uh, rest of the day, it's fairly low. And during the nighttime, there's nothing. So now I'm adding the third complexity, location dependent, within location, time dependent. And within that, within the day, month dependent, within it's also time dependent in any given day. It's fairly a complex system. We cannot just take a solar panel and connect it to the electrolyzer and expect some outcome to come out. For example, a big company which is consuming X tons of hydrogen and they're asking, uh, we need completely green hydrogen. Then you have to literally think of all the issues that I've highlighted today, highlighted in the past three slides, in order to produce consistently that X tons of hydrogen every day to meet the industry requirement and every day to meet the housing requirements in order to power air conditioning, in order to whatever it is, in order to meet the transportation energy requirements. And so the problem is not simple as we look at the global like aerial, pers aerial view. It's, it's really complex. The thing is, I'm just trying to provide some basic solution or shall we think in this direction? Like this is the deficit, whatever that, let's say that I'm putting the requirement in the green, like let's say in any given day, that's a requirement. And I have a deficit here, deficit, the one highlighted in the sky blue color, it's a deficit. How can I potentially go over this deficit and try to meet the requirement? One of the ways is that I can install more solar panels, the easiest way. I can store that in the batteries during the data, during the time, whenever the solar panel energy is, whenever I generate excess energy from the solar panels and feed it back to the power conditioning unit. I'm not trying to say it is economical or whatever. I'm just providing various options available. That's it, as simple as this. Now, there is also an op option. We can continue anyway. We are generating grid power by burning fossil fuels and we have hydrothermal plants and we have nuclear power plants. And shall we use the grid power directly to support the deficit? Possible. The other thing is that you can supply the excess energy from the solar panels back to the grid during the daytime or during the midday when the, excess, when the energy is excess and take it back whenever you require to run your electrolysis. Or it can also operate wind mills, wind turbines to get that excess energy. The thing is that when we install electrolyzers, they have to operate at their highest rated performance. So I've given this example in one of the previous meetings. You try to buy a big aircraft, uh, a, a Boeing A380 aircraft, and you just fly the pilots and the cabin crew. This is not why we buy the A380. Uh, it, it's meant to fly 550 people. The same story applies to electrolyzers. Electrolyzers are not meant to operate at low current densities and produce small amount of hydrogen. It's meant to operate at its peak performance in order to generate or at, at its peak uh, ability. And that's when the techno and economical viability will come into the play. And as a, as a person in academia, I think we look at the technical viability and we often ignore that economic viability. And if we want to put that economic viability into the show, we need to operate at its peak performance all the time. If we have to do that, we have to bring all these things. There is no single solution. We need to bring all the factors, all possible energy generation sources, couple them, and then try to run the electrolyzers. And eventually, the, the potential green hydrogen thing will be met. And you know, this is a complex problem we need to work with. So the conclusion that I want to, or the thought process that I want to provoke in your minds is the following, simple. The thing is that the system is not very simple. We need to really work on analyzing various energy availability. Like it can be solar energy availability across the India, wind energy availability across the India, and the requirements of energy at various locations, and we need to map it. And you know, we have this grand ambition, and I think we, like, we need to come together, industry, academia, and not just one expertise can really solve this problem. And I'm an electrochemical guy. I'm, I'm a person who knows metal science. I'm a person who knows how to characterize optical properties. I know how to characterize solar cells, electrolyzers. But do I know electronics to build like power conditioning unit? Answer is no. 
do I know how to integrate all these systems? Maybe to some extent. Now we need to bring in industry experts to it as well in order to solve this big problem. We have the fantastic solar panels. We have the fantastic electrolyzers. Now the problem is integration. This is, as an academician, I feel that has to be done immediately if you want to meet India's hydrogen requirement by 2030. And if you want to meet uh, the, the climate change, cli the re reduce the warming of the earth by uh, by by uh, less than 1.5 degrees Celsius or two, two, 2 degrees Celsius, okay? Great. What I want now to put forward to the industries is the following. Anyone who is attending here, anyone who might be watching later, is we want to do all this analysis, how the intensity of the light, you know, I've given the global problem, like variation in the light, whatever. Now I've given a slightly like kind of more technical details. I want to do light and temperature dependent PV or electrolyzer performance because the performance of these things do change with light and temperature variation. And we want to check the efficacy of the electrolyzer when we operate them at various uh, conditions when I couple batteries and solar cells, when I couple, when I couple uh, solar panels and wind energy together, like there'll be a lot of complexity coming in. And then we want to do the system optimization. We would like to see if we can do grid independent, grid dependent system. And finally, we would like to literally solve, can we do all renewable? And this is what we need to do. And I'm not discussing a lot of finer details here. I would like anyone to literally just please do send an email or like just talk to us and we would like to literally work with you and try to solve this big problem. Now, let me go slightly into the research. I change gears and look, go into the futuristic perspective. Whatever I've talked so far in the past 10 to 15 minutes is all the immediate requirements that India needs to act upon. And what I'm talking now, or going to talk now, is going to be the futuristic thing when India wants to go completely into new technologies that can have a disruptive change in the green hydrogen and in terms of cost of the green hydrogen. Now, I have so many components here. Can I just bypass all of them and try to move to a completely new system? The answer is yes. And that's what my group is really working on. And that is what is called photoelectrochemical solar water splitting, where initially I've said photoelectrochemical water splitting avoids two systems, that is solar panel plus electrolyzer. Now I'm saying, I can skip all these components together, like in one go completely, and then change it with a single system. But of course, the TRL level is like two or three. It has to go to very high. It's, it's totally futuristic. It cannot come out to the market right away. There are a lot of problems. I'm going to just give you some problems. What is need, What needs to be done for this photoelectrochemical cells, which does the job of all the components that I've highlighted before, like or besides this gray bar, and simply I can put it with this thing. guys. And I, I know this, this is a famous uh, uh, comedy from a Tamil comedian called Vadivelu. If you're a, if you're a ardent, I'm a ardent lover of his comedies. And you know what he does? There is a mat. It's made from like uh, some, uh, some uh, natural thing. It just like rolls up. If you try to open up one side, it will roll up from the other side. So the entire comedy is about, he tries to make it flat. That's it. So the thing is that he tries to open up one side, it rolls up. The other side of the mat, he tries to open up, the, the, the opposite side rolls up. The problem with the solar water splitting is the same, efficiency and stability. If you try to increase efficiency, stability goes down. If you try to increase stability, efficiency goes down. So it's a kind of, you know, like a, like a really, a, really a nightmare, really a nightmare for us. And that nightmare, of course, we need to really, uh, we have plans to solve that nightmare too. It's more like how we can make this mat, mat flat, as simple as this, that's what we are addressing. People can think of silicon. You know, we have a fantastic silicon semiconductor, well explored in many communities, right? Can we use that? It's very efficient, right? The solar cells give like uh, f f uh, like uh, 50, uh, 16 percentage efficiency at the panel level and more than 20 percentage efficiency, uh, 25 percentage efficiency in the lab scale. The thing is that the moment you put it in water directly, it will oxidize to silicon dioxide when you try to operate, when you try to oxidize water. The problem is people try to deposit protection layers and use it. Now, on the other side, let, let me take rust, iron oxide. I'm sure all of us have seen iron oxide, the rust in, uh, of, the, of the iron, uh, you might have seen it, the brown color guy. It is extremely stable. The problem is it's not very efficient. So I, it's a kind of, uh, like it's a kind of this uh, uh, same issue that uh, comedy really well faced in this movie with this mat. What in our lab, what we do to solve this problem? We have a global strategy that we operate with. So we try to design and develop a catalyst, which is stable. And uh, catalyst can 
be anything, semiconductor, it can be metal, anything. And we implement them in the photoelectrochemical cell. And eventually, if the cell is good, we try to understand why they are good. If the performance is bad, we still do understand why the performance is bad. And then we put the loop back in to design better catalyst. This is simple strategy that we follow for my entire group, entire group. Knowingly and unknowingly, we are following it. And it, it, it turns, it, it worked out really well. It worked out really well. And uh, lately, you might have noticed that uh, apart from silicon, the perovskite solar cells, the, material, the solar cells made of perovskite semiconductors. So this is National Renewable Energy chart, which gives efficiency as a function of years, over years. And you can see something like the blue one is silicon, which is nearly flat, nearly flat. It's not improving much. However, I would like you to draw your attention to this one right here. The I, I don't know if I can zoom that up. Let me see if I have that option. Yeah, cool. Yeah, sure. Here, you can see this one right here, the brown circle with yellow fillings. In less than 10 years, these are solar cells made with perovskite. In less than 10 years, the efficiency surpassed silicon. You can see that this is also silicon, which is only 23%. The perovskite got into 25.5. And I will also see like there is another one, silicon and then the perovskite tandem. You can see that brown color triangle, up triangle with blue filling. It has gone to 29.5 percentage. The problem with this solar cell is the same as what we face with the silicon. The moment you, at least silicon is very stable in the, very stable in the ambient conditions. These perovskite are not stable in even ambient condition. I typically joke with my students. You, you, you synthesize perovskite and you just say that water, I think by hearing the word water, they'll decompose instantly. That's, that's how bad they are. Although they are like now they try to encapsulate it, bring it out to the market. When this whole issue of stability was there in the market, one of my brilliant students, uh, his name is Hamdan, he came out with a variant of perovskite, which is called a vacancy ordered perovskites. And this absorbs entire sunlight. The good part of this material is it is the most rugged material I've ever seen. Honestly, most rugged material. It is stable in any pH. The way also, it's also stable in pH level. It was it's stable for more than like two two years now in the ambient conditions, and the the thing is that we can argue that we have platinum, great that's fine. But what we are trying to do now is and and by the way we have used this material, so this is in fact the world's most stable material. I really mean this statement, world's most stable material, a semiconducting perovskite, and we have also demonstrated solar water splitting with it. And the, the water splitting efficiency is similar to the iron oxide. People have been working for three decades now. And we have already reached that efficiency similar to the iron oxide. And I think a lot of researchers have to step onto this field to do one most important thing, to understand why this metal is stable. We are also trying to understand that. And the next thing is that we also try to replace the platinum by something else in future, which is a low cost element. And that is something as an academic, academic person or academic people really have to look into in order to use this stable material to bring this direct solar water splitting system to the market. And this paper, the work was published into uh, very high impact journals. And in fact, it was also highlighted in some of the news reports. And uh, I would like to quickly draw your attention to like only one thing. I'll take like five minutes now, not more than that. So we work all the way from like large scale devices down to the materials at the atomic level. And I would like to show you how we tweak systems at the atomic level. And why we do that, that's what I'm going to talk now. The thing is that why we have to literally tweak at the atomic level. One is stability I've talked about. You might have heard a term called recombination in solar cells in water splitting. It means you try to shine light and you try to extract the electrons out of it. Electrons are just current at the end of the day. If the electrons are lost within the device without going to the external circuit, we call that as recombination. And to increase recombination, like reduce the recombination, increase the performance, there is one parameter called electron lifetime. We have to increase the electron lifetime. I'm talking about electron lifetime. And I'm going to show you one strategy, how we tweak the system at the atomic level in order to increase the electron lifetime. This is a class of metal called double perovskites. This is, these are also stable. This is just a standard chemical formula with, uh, this is a crystal structure. And uh, what I want to uh, like look into is, so there is one atom in the middle, which is the M atom. And then it has various, the green colored atom in the corner, which is the halide. And then the next one is another atom. You see that gray one, which is made of one plus cation. And that's also surrounded by uh, six halides. So essentially you see an octahedra is formed by M plus one cation. 
and octahedra is formed by m plus 3 cation and they run in three dimensions i've given only like a, like a, just an image but they run in three dimensions and the pores formed by this cat like this octahedra is occupied by the a site okay now all these octahedra are symmetric means the bond length between all of them are the same so essentially i've kind of just pulled out only one in in two dimension like you can look at this row right here you see that the distance between gray and then this uh, halogen and then the gray cation and then this halogen are same same thing is true when i have this uh, pink color to the green and then the pink color to the green on all six sides of the octahedra they are the same what we have done is instead of using a single plus three site we try to introduce a mixed trivalent site and the condition is that this new trivalent system that is three plus system will have a different bond distance with the halogen you see that it has expanded and because of this expansion there is a distortion encountered in this octahedra formed by this gray color one plus cation and uh, we have done that nicely but this is a material and this is a crystal structure i'm just showing only that octahedra this is not some random diagram it is actually the crystal structure we have solved at the atomic level using single crystal diffraction here you can see that in the top two metal you have indium and indium as a trivalent both similar now you see this ag has ag and cl bond distances 2.7 whatever and then here also 2.7 whatever like both are same now when i try to introduce a mix of indium and bismuth you see that one side of ag is 2.8 the other side is 2.6 angstrom the distance between the bonds do change and the, the paper is quite exhaustive work actually and uh, i want to just like uh, how to interpret this curve so this is the decay of the excited state essentially as you see the plot like this like uh, as the plot goes like on the top it is interpreted as extremely high lifetime or low recombination when the decay happens very quickly this is uh, actually a photoluminescence decay as a function of time when the decay happens very quickly we say recombination is fairly high fairly high you could see that these are like pure materials although i've written indium and bismuth when i say indium it's not actually indium this is this compound here and indium decays very quickly and so do the other end member however when you mix the bismuth and indium you see that lifetime increased from few nanoseconds to microseconds and even more than microseconds it's, it has not decayed completely so we tweak the system at the atomic level in order to increase the recombination lifetime or in order to increase the uh, electron lifetime to reduce the recombination and eventually improve the performance in the devices we are still working on it uh, on how they perform in the devices and uh, by the way like like as i said but it's because of serendipity the distortion that you have introduced by mixing this indium and bismuth uh one of my i have a brilliant postdoc his name is tamar chelvan he found out this metal turned out to be a fantastic white light emitter and you know like all of a sudden we, we like switched the track and we found out why this uh, metal emits white light and then we tried to understand the, all the fundamentals and uh, uh, this work was published uh, in a nature publication from uh, called communications materials and this is one of the most exhaustive fundamental scientific paper i would like you to it's a open access anyone can access it so you can you're welcome to read that and uh, this one was also patented the specific distortion induced light emission and uh, it fetched the dst technology translation award and we also do work on large scale scale up i'm showing here carbon dioxide electrolyzers to convert carbon dioxide to fumes with that i would like to just point all the researchers what we have to do for the future we have to solve the problem of stability and efficiency at the same time and uh, we have made one material but that's not the end we need to learn from this and try to replace platinum and go to the and we have to scale it up and we have to check their performance in the large scale and their efficacy in the big devices so the solution to the problem is make the mat flat and with that i would like to thanks thank you so much for attending this session and uh, i would also uh, like to thank our moderator for spending his precious time to host this session thank you so much thank you sir uh, for a very very perceptive uh, lecture in fact it uh, brought back some memories uh, I, before i became a computer scientist i actually started and later dropped out of a phd at uh, thin film lab at iit delhi and i was working on amorphous silicon solar cell so it was great to see that chart of yours where you had the 1980s and it was all between 4% and 6% efficiencies for uh, crystalline and, and amorphous silicon was even lower than that it was 1 or 2% at that time 
So uh, it's great to see the things are now, you know, well uh, uh, to the right of that, and they are now, you know, beyond 29, 30, 40 percent. Uh, amazing progress over the last uh, two or three decades. Uh, let me just ask a few starter questions. There are uh, a couple of questions already on the chat. I request all the the attendees to put down your questions for Professor Arvind on the chat, and I'll I'll relay them to him. Uh, but let me get uh, you know things started first. Uh, first of all, you know we. Uh, talked about in the earlier part of your uh, lecture on the uh, the hydrogen uh, usage in industry in multiple contexts in fertilizers in steel and in, in construction and so on and so forth. Uh, there was uh, also uh, one of those things was on transportation. You know, hydrogen uh, in either directly as a, uh, as a as a fuel or in the form of methanol and metho methanated uh, petroleum products. Uh, the chart that you showed on the mitigation of the, uh, the carbon uh, footprint challenge that anybody has, India specifically, but the world at large, did that consider hydrogen itself as, the, uh, as, as a potential fuel, or was it all indirect use of hydrogen only? Uh, you mean this one, sir? The, uh, I, I guess you're talking about that, yes, right? Yes, yes, this one, correct. Uh, no, here there is no specific mention to hydrogen. It okay. is about how to mitigate that emission. And uh, what I what I thought is, what I kind of projected is, a part of it can be mitigated using solar. And okay. if you want, yeah, and then eventually that solar energy have to be stored somewhere. And that's where hydrogen come into the play. Okay. And uh, yeah, yes, yes. So you're looking at it from the solar and hydrogen uh, intersection rather than hydrogen as a fuel itself and all the other um, stuff. Okay, exactly. Great. thanks. Um, second uh, thought that I had is that given uh, coming to the second part of your talk on the, uh, uh, the, the wonderful work that you have now uh, figured out on the uh, perovskites and then beyond that into your uh, award-winning uh, paper and so on, uh, how, uh, you know, you mentioned that these are all relatively low TRL uh, technologies. Uh, how, based on your experience on on other aspects of your research in in solar cells and materials and so on, uh, how competitive is this uh, today? Suppose you are now at year two of the cycle and you said it's somewhere between TRL two and three. Uh, mm -hmm. Other technologies that you have seen which have had a head start, you know, will it take us five years, ten years to reach a TRL seven or eight? Wait. Uh, that's a fantastic question. Now it's more about comparing the technology that we are developing and what has been done elsewhere and uh, the the trajectory that they're following. Let me try, try to divide that question like into two: the existing ones and uh, the new ones. The existing ones, almost all of them, which are trying to do the water splitting, use as some sort of surface coating on the top of them. Eventually, for example, you can take silicon and coat uh, some sort of titanium dioxide on the top of those surfaces. And uh, as long as those surface coating remains intact in the electrolyte medium, the devices work. But then the proven technology, the best known technology, it's only up to 10,000 hours in the laboratory. And the deposition has to be done by what is called atomic layer deposition to deposit pinhole free deposition on the top of silicon or on the top of gallium arsenide based solar cells. The technology ALD, atomic layer deposition, it's freaking expensive when we want to scale it up and do it at the large scale. So the problem comes in two, two, two dimensions. One is the cost. You cannot reduce the cost of atomic layer deposition. The thing why we need atomic layer deposition is that we need an ultra thin layer, but a compact layer pinhole free compact layer. We cannot go to conventional solution process and then make it happen. We have to literally go to that ALD technique. So cost wise, first is the bottleneck. The second thing is that in spite of making an pinhole free uh, ultra thin protection layer, they tend to decompose over time, even if there is one pinhole and that is sufficient to degrade the device in less than one to two years time, actually. So although the technology is very matured, the stability is kind of hampered. In the long run, it may be a hurdle. Whereas whatever we, are, we have developed, although we have not proved at the large scale, but we are betting on that stability as a key thing. And uh, we have written a bunch of proposals to really scale those 
uh, scale the devices with these materials up. And when that happens, we don't need a protection layer at all. The cost of protection layer will be, uh, will be out. And then the hidden issue of the decomposition of the protection layer will also be out of the business. So it will be technically like economically competitive. But being said that there is also like the, there might be some unexpected uh, unexpected uh, downsides, which we have not seen so far uh, at the lab scale level, may come up at the large area devices. And uh, we are anticipating some issues. We cannot go just like a, a free running. And we expect anticipate issues. Even if we anticipate issues and we tend to solve those issues in one to two years, uh, we wanted to do a prototyping in three years down the line. Three years down the line, we need to literally show a large area device with these materials. And three to five years down the line, we want to literally replace platinum with an alternate material by understanding the strategy on why this specific material is stable. In fact, uh, there are some results which I have not discussed. There are also new materials my guys have invented. Uh, and those are like a rugged, you know, like more like a more like the CS2 PTI6, which I've shown. And we are slowly learning on how to make more and more stable devices. At the same time, keep absorbing the entire sun spectrum. And when we replace the platinum and then try to move to a low cost material, we will implement the knowledge on the scale up that uses platinum based semiconductors and try to bring the new material and couple both of them and then put it into the market. So that's going to take like three to five years down the line. Uh, I mean, we've been a bit optimistic, but I mean, we've been aggressive also in solving this problem. Three to five years is not not bad. I was expecting like decades. So, you know, we're, that'll be well within the, <laughs> the feasibility. <laughs> so, and, and lots of questions are from the audience. So let me just switch gears and go to the audience before I come back to my questions. Yes, so on yes. this particular chart, uh, Raghu, uh, my friend, Raghu Tam Rao has uh, asked a question. Are those wedges on that graph, are they... Yeah. Uh, just indicative of they've been drawn to scale, you know, the techniques other than solar, uh, the, you know, the carbon capture, et cetera, et cetera, were they all drawn to scale or was it uh, something which is uh, just indicative? Uh, just indicative. They are not drawn to scale, but they give like a clear indication that every wedge should contribute to nearly 70 gigawatt okay. energy generation that is carbon free. We'll go back and look at that paper. So thanks. Raghu yeah. had another question, but there are two, three others that I'll come back and, and ask you. Uh, on the, uh, there was a question from Ramakrishna Kota on uh, is carbon dioxide to methanol, uh, is it a viable option? I don't know what the context of that question is, but if you can make sense of it. Uh, CO2 to methanol, I think it's in the context of uh, carbon capture. Uh, I don't know whether you have the expertise to answer that question. Yes. So yeah, I mean we have in fact two uh, proposed two projects running at the moment on carbon dioxide conversion to fuels. Initially, when we started this, like thought of even working on this carbon dioxide to conversion to fuels, we thought only of methane and methanol. And then we interacted, in fact, with Tata. I mean TSA uh, MRC. In fact, that was one of the first uh, stops we have uh, went through to stop to project to send this proposal up. What we have understood from the very nice discussions we have had with them is. The methanol and methane are dirt cheap at the moment that you're getting from the fossil fuels. They find that there is a big hurdle, like the amount of methane or methanol that we are going to produce from direct photoelectrochemical conversion is going to be far expensive for one primary reason, that is the land acquisition cost, and then the CO2 pumping cost across the entire photoelectrochemical system. And then the product acquisition cost, that is, it's going to be like you cover like several meters, several several kilometer squares of uh, uh, solar panels or photoelectrochemical CO2 reduction panels. And you're going to collect like the product in micrograms or milligrams. And the collection is going to be far more expensive. And the land acquisition cost and then the amount of production of this methane or methanol is not going to be viable at all. Like, so that's out of the question. Then what can be the next possible scenario? The thing is that we have to couple solar panels with electrolyzers. I have talked about electrolyzers for water splitting. And in our lab, we have also built electrolyzers to convert CO2 to syngas or CO2 to formic acid. And formic acid seems to be one of the very nice strategies to work with. And uh, what uh, we, we are focusing on at the moment is that the electrolytic formic acid conversion from CO2 has a lot of economical value than the methane and methanol. So I strongly believe we need to move into the direction either to generate syngas using CO2 electrolyzers or to uh, 
uh, like formic acid production until we come out with a highly efficient photoelectrochemical CO2 that generates several tens of milliampere uh, hours, milliampere's uh, in the devices. So at the moment, we are generating one milliamps, which is nothing. The silicon panels generate 35 milliamps. So I think we are like, uh, at, uh, like uh, far away from it. Good, thanks. Thanks, sir. And uh, uh, there's a fairly detailed question from my colleague in TCS research, uh, Sriram. Uh, on, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's talked about some DFT calculations that he's done. He's actually working on perovskites, and I know that we have a session scheduled with uh, Dr. Bina Rai and, and, and this team. But uh, the, the crux of the question is, what are the variations you have tried in terms of uh, tweaking the halide itself? You know, that it was very interesting to see how you have managed to, uh, you know, shift the structure, as you have described, down to the angstrom level and moving things to the left and the right in that representation. So, you know, he has basically said that some of his calculations are showing that mixed halides can give you similar band gaps with enhanced stability. Uh, and is it possible to synthesize these mixed halides and so on and experimentally prove this? Yeah. So, by the way, I think uh, I think I've met Sriram once, I guess. Uh, hi, Sriram. That's a fantastic question. Um, so, thing is, in our lab, whatever composition you could imagine, we have synthesized and we have ripped them off. So, the one that you have said is completely done in our group. The one, the mix of bromide and chloride, we have done that. And we have changed the uh, the Ag to sodium. We have changed bismuth to indium to antimony. We have changed to bromide to chloride to some extent iodide. So literally, uh, and then we have changed the A site, cesium to um, potassium to rubidium. We have changed everything. We have almost every composition that, I mean, I, I have a very, very brilliant, highly hardworking team, actually. They literally ripped the entire periodic table off. <laughs> and <laughs> unless some miracle happens, we can, there will be no more material uh, that someone can synthesize beyond what we have done. And many of those papers are in pipeline as uh, Ram, and I'm sure we will be discussing many of them in our uh, personal discussions. Yes, thanks, Ram, right. for that nice question. Thank you, sir. And, and you know, as you're describing it, I was visualizing the periodic table going duck, duck, duck down the. <laughs> down the, the <laughs> anyway, great work. Uh, Raghu, uh, Raghutam Rao uh, uh, has a, another question, and uh, he said, first, first of all, thank you for the fantastic presentation. And uh, he says that you did not cover much on CO2 absorption, saying that it's in very early stages. Uh, has an accelerated artificial photosynthesis been tried with some success? Uh, do you have any opinions on that? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Raghu. I think this question, I think, uh, yeah, we never, we, we've met sometime personally. Thanks for attending the talk, Raghu. Like, so sometimes when I defend my proposal on CO2, I talk very differently. But today I'm honestly talking from my heart. So that's why I've said, although I try to push CO2 so hard when I try to defend a proposal in a funding agency, but the reality is something very, very different. The CO2 thing at the moment, it's still at the lab scale demonstration. The thing is that the conversion of CO2 to, let's say, methanol, it is a six electron process. CO2 to methane, it's an eight electron process, reduction process. Whereas water to hydrogen, it's just a two electron process. So it's easy to carry out a two electron process than a eight electron process. The problem with the CO2 is also that you cannot have only one output. If when I split water, very, very clear, I'm going to get only hydrogen and oxygen. That's it. When I try to convert CO2, reduce CO2, I can get carbon monoxide, I can get formic acid, I can get methane, I can get methanol, I can get ethane, I can get ethylene, any products. So finding the right catalyst to selectively convert to one product is a nightmare. You know, I'll just give you one example on the electrolysis we have built. Um, one of my uh, students, he is working on converting CO2 selectively to formic acid. Even with all the best things we have done, we could only convert to 80 percentage. Best of it is 80 percentage of CO2 to formic acid. Rest 20, we have all sorts of other products. All sorts of other products. The thing, the problem comes in the following. Imagine I'm generating formic acid. Imagine I'm also generating methanol along with it. Methanol and formic acid together are liquids. Now I have to invest money in separating these two guys. Imagine I generate purely carbon monoxide and H2, done, it's very good. Imagine I generate carbon monoxide, H2, and methane, then I have to invest energy in separating uh, methane and carbon monoxide. So that's a, that's a kind of nightmare we are facing at the moment. I think, although like uh, when we read papers, like when you see read the news uh, news uh, letters, it, it looks like that the problem has been solved, but it has not been solved. Thing is that we have hopes, 
we have ways to really uh, find uh, under, uh, like solve those problems but we need time as simple as this we need five to ten years down the line to really solve this so effectively follow-up question from ragu is uh, effectively saying the solar biofuels are still far away in time uh yes definitely definitely but we cannot keep silent and do it we have to aggressively pursue it and the, like uh, and then try to uh, push it forward like the way i've said we are aggressively working on water splitting we do have a team working aggressively on co2 conversion to fuels and i think we are taking both the directions although in my lab i think uh, more stress for hydrogen than carbon dioxide conversion but we have a separate ccus center which is funded by uh, 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 IOE, from IOE funds from IIT Madras, where I'm a part of. So the entire team is working on carbon dioxide utilization. So uh, we hope to come out with some good outcome, uh, probably in five years down the line. Thanks. So the last question uh, from the audience is from my colleague uh, Abhishek in TCS Research. In fact, he works in our uh, uh, same materials group. Uh, his question is uh, perhaps related to what you just said that carbon intensive industries like iron and steel, cement, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what hope is, them, uh, is there for them for reducing their uh, carbon footprint? So the CCUS that you said, that's potentially one, but you know, people have been talking about uh, hydrogen in, uh, in, in steel instead of carbon, uh, because that's their biggest uh, challenge. And construction also has the same, the same issue. So any work going on in IIT Madras on, for these carbon intensive industries, uh, for their uh, footprint reduction? Yeah, okay. So that's a very nice question, actually. So I think, you know, like this is like kind of like hitting the head directly on the academicians and say, are you really looking into the real requirements? And that's this exact question uh, really uh, asked that. So I don't have a quantitative information, but I'll give qualitative information for this. There are some groups in material science who work on directly like processing the steel using solar energy like generating heat from the solar energy. That's one direction, which is completely, they don't use oil to burn or heat up the furnaces. Rather, they use the energy from the sun, concentrate it and generate heat. That's one direction. And the thing is that, imagine if they are still using the regular fuels, the CO2 is being emitted. And at IIT Madras, they are working on converting this carbon dioxide back to fuels catalytically, back to fuels uh, using photocatalytically or electrocatalytically. The thing is that I feel catalytic reduction is probably one of the ways uh, industries have to really take direction immediately. I think, but then the, where the power comes from catalyst is a different business. We have to literally use solar cells back again, I guess, or wind energy that is there. And uh, we also have the kind of carbon sequestration that's also happening. Like they can literally go uh, dump everything uh, and underneath the uh, sea. And there is one more area which we are kind of not so explored, which we're not exploring is using microbes to convert CO2 to fuels. In our lab, I mean, we are, we are working on a blue sky research on trying to understand how microbes literally convert X to Y. That's what we are working on. We are working extensively on cyanobacteria and we are still at a very nascent stage. We are trying to understand how these microbes, cyanobacteria and what we call as a Shimnella monadensis, uh, we use both photosynthetic as well as non-photosynthetic microbes to convert carbon dioxide to fuels. And I believe if at all something is going to take up to the market of carbon dioxide conversion, it can be these microbes. Because what we are trying to do is not trying to tweak the microbes, rather we're trying to understand how they convert. But if we can implement it in the large scale, by like nowadays, I think uh, almost all the pharmaceutical industries try to decontaminate using bio uh, methods. So. This can also be followed for the CO2 also in big companies. I think it has something to do with policy regulations also on how, and also technically we have to evaluate how much of this CO2 can be converted to uh, useful fuel or at least neutralize them using microbes. Great, sir. I think uh, you know, there is one other question from Sriram, which is a follow-up on his earlier question, but I'll, I'll with his permission, defer it to the, the follow-up meeting that we're anyway planning with him and his team. Now, I'll just try to conclude with one uh, question of my own, which uh, uh, is related to what you just said. There is a lot of potential intervention at the policy level that can happen in India. You mentioned that in the US, there is a, an organized body which is looking at uh, the kind of research that is helping the, uh, uh, the solar uh, industry there, especially the, uh, the kind of calculations required which you have done for JNK and so on. Uh, what are the kind of interventions do you think that policymakers should look at? And therefore, indirectly for this audience, you know, we have alumni, we have people from industry, we have people from academia. What is it that we should 
look at in terms of influencing the policy so that this kind of research can move faster. Okay. So <clears throat> one thing is that <clears throat> one common, uh, like that's very, very important question. One thing what I've done before I thought about this, what India has to do. I studied how US and Europe tried to follow up a trajectory on implementing this hydrogen uh, economy and how we are trying to do it. And uh, I've also followed how US and Europe tried to do that for solar cells or solar panels in general and how we did. In India, in US and uh, Europe, they have done a systematic study on first identifying what is available and what is possible to achieve. And what I mean by what is available is how much of solar energy is available and what are all the technologies within solar panels. We have multiple technologies. They try to take which if you use implement this technology and if you cover so much of land area and in this location, we get this amount of solar power. So they had a kind of systematic outcome and they did the same thing for hydrogen as well by trying to find out the industry requirements and what is required in future and everything. But in India, I don't know if the policymakers have not made those information public, but based on the information I've read from the websites, uh, either PMO office or Niti Aayog, they don't have a clear trajectory on what is available to us and what is possible to harvest. And once we fix that information, then we know what trajectory we have to follow and what is the requirement. As of now, if you go to Ministry of uh, like Transportation, they give some value. I think it's very difficult to really know what is the actual energy consumption by the transportation sector within the country. And what is the energy consumption by the industry sector? What is the energy consumption by uh, like airline or marine sector? We, do, we don't have that like cumulative information in one place. And once we have the requirement, once we know what is possible to theoretically achieve, then we can lay a roadmap. And if we do that, and I think we will be on the very good track. It'll be on very good track. And this is something And in every newspaper I see, we have a lot of sun and ask anyone, what is the lot of sun? No one can answer that. Honestly, I'm saying that very, very for sure. And that lot of sun, and that is what we need to answer first. And that is what I think policymakers have to probably look into in order to really uh, give India and, and Nitya really doing a phenomenal job now with really like a really fantastic uh, team of young guys and uh, experienced fantastic uh, visionaries. And I think uh, we should also keep influencing them with all this input from academicians perspective and then try to get the best. Excellent. So I think this is a very pers you know, perceptive thing. And as you were as you were uh, talking, I was uh, reminded of the fact that this could be actually done in terms of actual data gathering on something as simple as solar intensity on a given location. Uh, we have thousands of schools uh, all over the country, uh, high schools and middle schools and so on. So uh, it's not that difficult to for a school physics department to actually do this kind of a basic setup to set up a photometer and just take readings 10 times a day. Uh, it could be a nice uh, 10 standard or 12 standard project for a student. But if you do a sigma aggregation of it across the country, then uh, within two years you have all your raw data at a very, very high level of fidelity. Right? This is what we're trying to do with the pollution uh, device that uh, IIT Madras has produced and it's uh, a software device which is there in Delhi and other places. So we'll work on it offline, but thank you very much for a very perceptive thing. We have ranged from you know not just your path breaking research and award winning research, uh, on uh, uh, the problems that you have indicated, but also very practical ways uh, to convert that research into uh, you know uh, real products and services. The horizon one, as you said, the electrolyzer problem, and uh, you've given us a path on how that can be used uh, meaningfully and uh, to scale up hydrogen production, green hydrogen production. And on the other side, a little bit of a glimpse into the future in terms of uh, early stage research, but which is looking very promising, and the and the quality of work that you and your team are doing. Uh, I hope the audience is taking away a lot of confidence that uh, great research can happen in India, specifically at IIT Madras, and uh, you know, we are solving really uh, significant problems. Uh, thank you again, and uh, for the audience, uh, please do fill up the survey after the event is over. Uh, the survey is on the, uh, the login uh, page that you had, uh, uh, and on the registration page. Uh, Cab, we'd like to get your feedback and what else should we do to improve the uh, online webinar series. Uh, and before closing, I'd just like to give a heads up on the next sessions coming up in the webinars. 
Uh, we're going to be hosting uh, Mr. N. Lakshmi Narayanan, the former vice chairman of Cognizant, in our startup series next Saturday. Uh, and uh, in October, we have uh, a mixed uh, set of uh, sessions. Uh, there will be one on managing personal finance. This has come from a lot of members that uh, we need uh, to have some something on personal finance, especially in today's context. We have uh, a Voices of Excellence uh, session, uh, which will come in November uh, with uh, Chris Gopalakrishnan, who will be interviewed by Raju Venkatraman. Uh, and then November, we'll also see the quiz coming back with Ashwin Mahalingam as the quiz master. Uh, there will be music and popuri sessions and so on and so forth, uh, faculty and startup sessions, and of course, continue. So stay safe, stay well, and thank you for joining today. All the best. Thank you very much, sir, for hosting the session, and thanks, everyone, for staying up all the way. Great. Uh, thanks Thank again. You. Have a good night. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.